Grace to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Sometimes these slides, I, I make them too clever for my own good. There we go. Which would you choose? Justice or mercy? And I know that both are important. They're important to us personally and corporately, our society as well. But there's times in this world when you have to make a choice and it can be hard. I mean, really hard. Because I think that's what today's story from Matthew is about. It's about the choices that we make, in particular, about justice and mercy. First of all, there's the choice that's made by the Lord of the Vineyard to trust his manager to get the crop in on time. It's not always evident to us that there's two people involved in the story. There is the person who goes out and makes the hire, and he works for the person that owns the vineyard. One's the manager and one's the owner, the Lord. The next is the choices that the vineyard manager makes when he has to go into the marketplace five times, actually, altogether, looking for workers to get the job done. Now, this is not a good a judgment on his ability to manage the vineyard. You would think somebody who had some experience would know how many workers it would take to bring in the crop. He doesn't. He has to go out five times because he promised to bring it in by the end of the day and he just didn't have enough bodies to do it. Next, there's the choices made by the Lord who honors all the contracts. The manager goes out and says, I'll pay you what's fair, I'll pay you what's fair, I'll pay you what's fair. The expectations are unspoken. And at the end of the day, it's the Lord that has to decide he's going to pay all those workers, irregardless of how many there were, and also how much. And finally, there's a choice of the workers when they respond to the pay itself. And there's one more choice, I think, that this story just alludes to, and that's the choices that we make every day in our lives as a result of whether or not we're facing the issues of justice or mercy. So I want to pause here at the end of the story and, and ask you to put yourself in the sandals of those last paid, those who were last in line. Because you see, they had stood all day waiting for work to come along. The sun was past its zenith. I suspect they had all but given up any hope at all of working and they were ready to make the long, disappointing walk home. And these men were not lazy. They were unlucky. They had the misfortune of being at the back of the crowd, the back of the line. When the guy walks in, I need 10 people, boom, well, they took the first 10 and they were behind. They were not trying to make a little extra pocket cash either. They were looking for a day's wage to feed their families. A hundred years ago, these might have been cowboys standing around the town well, waiting for the local ranch foreman to come in and hire them to help rope in the stray doggies. Today, they would be the immigrants standing in the parking lot of Lowe's, waiting for a contractor to hire them to put up wall board or roofing. As I said, they're just trying to make enough money to put food on their table for that day a daily wage because that's the world that they lived in a world of absentee landlords a world that was divided between the haves and the have-nots a world where what we call food insecurity is what they called every day of their lives it's easy to imagine their gratitude when finally they get an offer to work even though they're not sure how much it's going to be even though the day is nearly done it's also easy to imagine their astonishment when a short time later, a very short time later, that same manager inexplicably pays them for the whole day. Now, put yourself in the sandals of these guys, the ones who had been at the front of the line, who'd been called to work 12 hours earlier and had worked the entire day through the heat of the afternoon. They also just wanted to make a living to put food on the table for their families. They also lived in the same world of absentee landlords and haves and have-nots. They too lined up to get paid at the end of the day. There was no controversy here. There was no written contract in their world. A spoken word was sufficient. It was the value of their world that a steward kept his word and would pay them a day's wage for a day's work. Fair is fair. But when the word travels down the line that those who were hired for only an hour were getting a day's wage, it's also not hard to imagine how in that moment they got all giddy in anticipation. They're doing the calculations in their head. And it's reasonable to assume that if those who worked only an hour got a full day's wage, well, those of us who worked 12, we ought to get more. Sadly, their anticipation turns to ash when the manager keeps his word and pays them exactly what they contracted for, a day's wage for a day's work. So here's the problem. Even for those of us who don't have to do this, stand around in the parking lot of Home Depot waiting for an offer of work, this 
story does not seem fair. They work 10 times longer than anybody else. It's not hard to understand why they had some resentment rather than gratitude, why it's grabbing hold of them. They began, as the Greek so colorfully puts it, to get mitzomai. Sounds like a word that, that, doesn't, that is nice. It's not. To grumble. We have a different word for it. It begins with a B, but I can't say that in church. And when he hears this grumbling, the Lord of the vineyard steps in. Not the guy who's been doing all of the deal making or making the payment, but the guy who owns the place. The guy who's responsible for all of this. He steps in because it was his manager, after all, who'd gone out five times in the town square looking for help. His manager, who wasn't so good at managing harvest and miscalculated the size of it and the number of workers needed to bring it in before the end of the day. That owner doesn't hold it against him, but he treats those workers oddly. In fact, he addresses them with a very strange word for the New Testament. He calls them friend. Now, that word may not seem so odd to you because it's, it's found 33 times in the New Testament. So it's a fairly common word. But here's what you don't know. The English word friend is used to translate to two different Greek words. The first one, more common word, is, is this one, philios. Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. Philios. It means associate or acquaintance. It's the kind of friend you might have at work that you may have coffee with in the morning or talk to casually. The friend you might have who lives down the street from you. You see them and wave to them and once in a great while you might run into them at the block party or at the Kroger and you, you may pass some pleasantries. These are casual friends, not people you rely on, people that you feel, you know, warm toward. There's no real commitment with them. There's no depth of affection. There's no real deep relationship. It's shallow, actually. But there's another word. That's the word that's used here. Heteros. It means companion, comrade, partner. It's a word that implies intimacy and a deeper relationship. A word that you use to address someone who's on a journey with you. A word that, in fact, Jesus used to address Judas in the Garden of Gethsemane. Friend, he said. Friend, do quickly what you must do. And it's used only four times in the whole New Testament. All of them in Matthew. Here is one of those places. Friend. Friend. Heteros is a word of connection. It's, it spends more currency than philios. The Lord calls that grumbling worker his friend. And as tempting as it is to dismiss those laborers as ingrates or label them as hard-hearted or misguided or whatever, we know their reaction is true and honest because that's the way we feel. If we were standing in their shoes, we'd feel exactly the same way. It's not fair. Fairness is not there. Those who worked an hour received the day's wage. Those who worked 11 deserve more. So I ask, what would you choose? Justice, what's fair, or mercy? Because you see, in this story, the Lord chooses mercy, and it should come as no surprise to anybody who's read the book of Matthew. Because you see, earlier in Matthew, in chapter 5, actually, Jesus says to his disciples, Do not think that I've come to abolish the law and the prophets. I've come not to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And then Matthew tells us about the ministry of Jesus and how he follows that to instruct us what he meant when he said, I come to fulfill the law and the prophets. His ministry was about reconciling people, about treating them as human beings and not as objects to be exploited, about turning the other cheek, about giving to those who beg from you even more than they ask. If somebody comes and asks for your cloak, or your coat, give them your cloak as well. It's about loving your enemies. And when the folks who heard Jesus say that started to grumble about the grand experiment that God was performing through him, Jesus said to them, God makes his sun to rise and set on the evil and the good alike. He sends his rain to fall on the righteous and the unrighteous. What is it you want me to do? Be fair? To be just? If we're waiting for God to strike the bad people with lightning, we're going to have a long wait. Because that's not the God that's revealed in the New Testament. So which would you choose, justice or mercy? And before you decide, I want you to remember this. Justice is about getting what you deserve. Justice is fair. But mercy is never fair because it's about not getting what you deserve. And occasionally those two, 
values will clash in this world because those workers wanted fairness, they wanted justice, they felt cheated because they calculated their wages according to what the manager had paid the latecomers, but that's what justice always does. It calculates, it keeps score because justice is about the law. Justice seeks to ensure that all people are treated equally. They get equal opportunity, equal standing under the law. That's why the symbol for justice is this, a blind lady holding a scale. She doesn't see anything. She just holds the scale. And as long as there's a balance, that's fair. But the Lord says that justice is not what he has in mind. Not when he pays those wages, it's something else. Something that Jesus also taught his disciples in Matthew, way back in chapter 6. After all that illogic about God's mercy in chapter 5, he says to them, and I want you to hear this, when you pray, pray like this. Father in heaven, your name is holy. Let your kingdom come, and you will be done on earth like it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins. And help us to forgive the sins of others. And don't bring us to the time of trial. Deliver us from the evil one. Doing God's will. Providing your daily bread. Granting forgiveness. Those are the qualities of mercy. They're not the attributes of justice. And when those two values, justice and mercy, clash, it can get ugly. Because where justice counts... Mercy loses track. Where justice holds tight, mercy lets go. Where justice keeps all things in balance, mercy gives things away and upsets the balance. Mercy is not the opposite of justice. Mercy does not tolerate or encourage injustice. Mercy moves us beyond the realm of justice into the realm of God, into the realm of relationships. Friends, heiteros, Listen to me. Think. Imagine. What would life be like if every relationship was governed by justice? Counting every slight. Marking every injury that you might never forget like an elephant. Keeping a careful record of every grievance until that amount gets balanced and your life is fair. Can you imagine life like that? Of course you can. That's life every day. That's the way most of us are most of the time. And if we stop to think about it honestly, we might come to the fair conclusion that that's a serviceable definition for hell, where everything is fair and you get what you deserve every time. As Pastor Sue observed last week, justice might allow room for a relationship to exist, but mercy and forgiveness heals relationships and makes them grow. And flourish. Now, here's the thing about that hypothetical choice between justice and mercy. It's not hypothetical at all. You make it every day of your lives. Like when you forget the times a colleague has been helpful and instead obsess on the slight you may have received. Or those times you overlook all the people who drove their cars reasonably and well and went off the scale when somebody cut you off. Or all those times you overlook the thousands of kindnesses that friends do on your behalf and instead nurse the grudge about the one thing they did or didn't do that hurt your feelings. At each of those turnings, each of those moments, you choose justice or mercy. Will you demand the law be upheld, the balance be restored, that fairness abound, or will you forgive? Will you love? Will you show mercy? Now, of course, we all want to show mercy. We all want to know justice. But the plain truth is it's hard. It's really hard. Because we're hardwired not to. I don't know why. We call it original sin in the church. Out in the world, they talk about it being something to do with evolution. Their way of teaching us how to avoid risk. They might both be right. I suspect they are. But all I know is that it's far easier to count your hurts than it is to count your blessings. That's your experience. That's my experience. So maybe I'm asking the wrong question. Which would you choose? Mercy or justice? Maybe I should point you to the truth. Which did God choose? Justice or mercy? Because that's why Jesus told this story, I think, in the first place. 
The primary actor in this story is not the workers. It's not the manager of the vineyard. It's the Lord. The one who found it more important to bring in the harvest than to make a profit. The one who kept sending that steward back into town looking for more workers right up to the 11th hour. Past the point it made any sense at all. Be hiring people to bring in the harvest. The one who insisted that everyone be given the chance to earn their daily bread. The whole part of it, not just a piece. The one who took his time to speak to those grumbling laborers and call them hyteros. My friends, the one who in every possible circumstance shows mercy over justice. The one who in every place makes us know that God's justice might make our lives better, but God's mercy will redeem them and heal them and make them whole. So when forced to choose between justice and mercy, between exercising judgment or forgiving, remember that God in Christ chose mercy. And no matter how much we might identify with those who worked all day in the blazing sun, Here's the other truth. There will come the day when we will be last in line. When we will be the last to be paid. When we will be those who have no good reason to expect such reckless generosity from our Lord. And in that moment, if this story is true, the Lord of the vineyard will look upon us and not do to us what is fair, but what is merciful. And that's what we preachers like to call good news. To God be the glory. Amen.